Good morning, Movement Church. Woo! All right. <laughs> uh, how happy are you to be here today? All right. All right. Well, we are happy that you are here today. And if this happens to be your very first time here at Movement Church, um, we are just so glad that you are here. Maybe you just haven't been here in a long time. And if that's the case, we just want to extend a special welcome to you. Hopefully, as you walked in this morning, you were able to uh, drop by our welcome desk and get a blue newcomer's bag. Uh, we just have some gifts in there for you. And also, if you're new, if you would be willing to just take out your phone and type new to MC to the number on the screen, 94,000. Uh, we just want to send you a couple of texts to let you know a little bit more about who we are here at Movement and how you can get connected. Now, if you have been here uh, for a while, um, you know about our ping pong balls. And if there's somebody here this morning that uh, is here because you invited them, if you would just have them write their name on a blue ping pong ball and drop that in the display that you'll see in the worship center lobby. And maybe you were able to have a faith conversation this week, a gospel conversation with maybe a friend or a neighbor or a coworker where you were able to share about who Jesus is and what he's doing in your life. If you would write their name on a white ping pong ball and drop that in the display, that display is just a visual representation of the impact that God is making through you here in Charlotte County. And we want to be able to pray over those names together with you. So would you, we're so glad you're here, and would you just uh, uh, stand as we begin our worship here this morning? Let's get a hands clap. Good morning, Movement Church. Excited to worship with y'all this morning. I just want to invite you to lift your voices up to praise the King of Kings and Lord of Lords this morning. No, don't give up, there is hope, there is hope. 
Recently, I was reading in John 6, the very familiar story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And I just wanted to share a few verses with you from that passage. It says, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he said, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip because he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we would never have enough to money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, and he said, Well, there is a young boy with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that for such a huge crowd? And you know, I was thinking about how when we are uh, confronted with overwhelming need, we often have that same reaction as the disciples did. 
Our first impulse can be to measure our resources instead of to focus on our provider. And, you know, Jesus was standing directly in front of the disciples. And all they could think to do was count the coins in their pockets and the few loaves and fish. But they couldn't make the math add up, not even close. You know, in the Gospels, Jesus often used incredibly flawed people and woefully inadequate resources to bring about his miracles. And that was by design. Because when God brought about the miracle and the blessing, he wanted it to be obvious to everyone that it wasn't because the person was so great or because the resources were so extraordinary. It was because he is. And Jesus used a little boy who was simply willing to part with his sack lunch. He was willing to use ordinary disciples who were simply willing to serve other people in need. And then God did what only he could do. And he multiplied that meal and he empowered their willingness to serve. And thousands of people were fed and loved and cared for that day. But they were not the only ones who were blessed that day. That little boy and those disciples, they received too. And I would argue that they perhaps received an even deeper blessing than the crowds did even, because they got to be a part of the miracle. <laughs> they chose to be a part of the miracle. And as a result, they received a greater appreciation, a deeper understanding of God's heart and his power. But at the same time, they couldn't take any pride in their role because no one left that day talking about the little boy's lunch. The people were not awed by the great waiters who served them their meal. They faded into obscurity as God's generous heart and his glory shone through. The people were amazed by Jesus because it's never the gift or the person or the serving that transforms. It's the hands who they're placed into. And John tells us uh, that even after everyone was filled that day, there were still 12 baskets left over. Friends, we can trust that when God leads us to give, we're not going to go hungry. He is always faithful to fill us with the blessing of understanding more deeply his heart and who he is when we choose to be a part of the miracle that he's doing. And I'm so excited that this week, I have some amazing reports of how God used you to be part of the miracle. I got to meet with uh, three impact partners this week. And when I sat down with Habitat for Humanity, I was able to say, yes, Movement Church will give you a $2,000 matching scholarship. And 91 cents of every one of those dollars goes right back into the community for affordable housing for your friends and your neighbors. I was able to sit down with Child Evangelism Fellowship and say, we'll provide $1,500 for training scholarships for young people in this community who want to learn how to share their faith. And then I was able to sit down with Pregnancy Solutions and say, we will give you $1,500 to sponsor Walk for Life so that 15 ultrasounds will be provided for the young moms that come through your center. That is because of your willingness to partner with God to be part of the miracle that he's doing in Charlotte County. So thank you. And if you want to continue to be a part of what God is doing, uh, you can do that right now. We have envelopes under the chairs in front of you. You can put check or cash in there and drop it in one of the wooden offering bins as you leave this morning. 
If you'd rather give by uh, online or by text, uh, there are instructions uh, on the screen behind me. But thank you for being part of what God is doing here in Charlotte County. Let's take a moment to pray over these offerings. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, man, what a privilege it is to be able to be a part of the miracle. Lord, you don't need us. You could do it all without us, but you, it is your pleasure to allow us to be a part of the work that you're doing. Lord, I pray for your blessing and your multiplication over these offerings. Bless both the given, gift and the giver, Lord, and we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. We trust them into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you rise as we continue to worship?
when the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Lord, we know that you are the God of transformation, that you are the God that can bring stubborn Pharaoh to his knees. Lord, we ask that you bring us to our knees as we seek you. Let us be quick to submit to you and say, not our way, but your way, Lord. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus sing to me I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus cause your name is power your name is healing your name
to give all of yourself, not just to us, but to the whole world. And God, we, I'll speak for myself, I feel so small in this room. And yet I know that when those doubts creep in, I can say, but God still called me. And God has called each and every single one of us. And so Lord, I ask that you grow us in our calling, that you we be driven to our knees and surrender and asking for more of you to speak Jesus over every part of our life. We pray this all in the name above all names, in the name of Jesus and God's people said, amen. 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 I am grateful that it is under that banner, the name of Jesus, that we get to gather in this place this morning. The Jesus who redeems, the Jesus who transforms, the Jesus who heals, the Jesus who restores. That's why we're here. Amen. And I think sometimes it's easy for us to forget that. It's easy to come and make of the church something that it isn't. When in fact, our chief aim, our purpose is to glorify God, to bring him all glory and honor and praise for who he is. Amen? Amen. Well, I am thrilled that we get to be together this morning as we continue in this series about what, really what it means to be the church, but who we are as a piece of the church, that we 
our movement. Again, as we've said every week, that yes, that is the name of our church, Movement Church, but it's more than that, that this idea is about we're part of a larger movement called the kingdom of God in the earth, that it represents uh, ownership, enthusiasm, uh, community, and connection, and being a part of something bigger than ourselves. That it's not exclusive to us, but we have the great privilege of being a part of it. And so we are movements. And we are a movement inviting people to, let's see if you know it. It got there at the end, so good for you. Way to go. Uh, We are, we're a movement inviting people to know Jesus, to love others, and to live changed. And listen, I want to say this. You guys are getting better every single week at remembering those blanks. So uh, thank you for not causing me to go home and curl up in a fetal position every week. Um, But we, we are a movement inviting people to know Jesus, love others, and live changed. And while we want you to remember that, the purpose of the memorization is that our lives and hearts would be moved by it. That we wouldn't just know a phrase, but we would live a lifestyle that is, in fact, uh, embodying of that phrase. Amen? And so last week, uh, we got to unpack another one of our values. Uh, Really what, uh, when we talk about values, what we're talking about are uh, core ideas, uh, these uh, marks of what it means to be a Christ follower. And so far, we've talked about a few of those. We started off together talking about life change, that that has to be the first and foremost and utmost priority of the church, that people would come to know the one who allows the old to be gone and the new to come, the Jesus that transforms lives. But we don't want them to stay there. We want to be a people who are constantly growing and changing and becoming more like him. And then last week, Pastor Dwayne did a fantastic job challenging us with this idea of honest community, what it means to live an authentic relationship. And I know that many of you, as we've heard the stories come in this week, many of you walked away from that message uh, loving Dwayne and really, really disliking Dwayne all at the same time. And listen, that's part of honest community, is it not? It's saying the difficult things. It's saying the things that are hard to hear, that are hard to process, even at hard times. And so today, we're going to unpack another one of those. As we look at this value, this mark of a Christ follower, what it means to practice and to promote extravagant generosity. That we should be a people, not just movement church, but the church. We should be a people that are marked by a lifestyle of extravagant generosity. We're going to look at two passages primarily today that you can go ahead and flip to and mark in your Bible there. Or uh, if you're looking at a tablet or your phone, you can pull both of these up. Those of you who are with us online, glad to have you. You can do the same thing there. One is going to be in Acts chapter 4, and the other one is Proverbs chapter 11. And there'll be a few other scriptures today that I'll mention as we go along. But while you flip there to Acts chapter 4 and Proverbs 11, I think that we can all agree, especially in American culture, we've got a pretty good finger on the pulse when it comes to extravagance. Yeah? Do you, you know what I'm talking about? Like, we're good at spending money on stuff. Let me give you an example. Uh, Let me give you actually a few examples that will kind of show us just how good we are at extravagance in our culture. The first actually happened to Mama Sita and I just a couple weeks ago. We had a day uh, just to hang out together. And so we went to this really cool little fresh market down in Cape Coral. Just saying, I know I'm getting older when I'm like, we had a day together and we went to the fresh market. Uh, But... (laughs) It was great. It was so cool. They had uh, like samples to enjoy and uh, these all kinds of different vendors there. Great time. Went to this fresh market. One of the things that caught our eye was in the back corner where they have the meat and fish section, all of that. They had back there Japanese A5 Wagyu beef. 
Now, some of you, I see RJ nodding his head. He is deeply moved into his soul by the thought <laughs> of being able to eat this. So Japanese A5 Wagyu beef. And we're like, wow, that is really cool. It's not something you see a whole lot of around here. But they get this imported in and they had it on sale. I was like, this is amazing. It's on sale. And we went back and looked. It was on sale for $198 a pound. Let me just say, if any of you want to bless your pastor <laughs> by inviting me to your house, but no, $198 a pound on sale. Tell me that we don't have the market on extravagance when we've got $200 steaks that haven't even been cooked yet. <laughs> Let's take it a step further. Uh, do we have any folks in the room, any ladies that, that just like a good purse? You love a good purse. Anybody? Like that's, <laughs> that's your thing, right? Mama Sita will tell you she didn't raise her hand, but she should. Uh, <laughs> she loves a good purse. Man, I'm telling you what, and I ain't going to lie, all the dudes in the room, you're a liar if you aren't down with it. I love a good purse too, because every now and then I'd be like, can you hold that? <laughs> I came across this in a J January 24th of this year. Uh, I found this in prepping for all of this in an article. This is a Birkin, a Birkin purse. Just the name sounds, woo. <laughs> this is the metallic Birkin, right? Need to know it's a small, it's smaller than a typical Birkin. I don't know this. I had to write this down. <laughs> it only measures 25 centimeters in total volume, which the only way I can interpret that is it holds two tic tac boxes instead of four. I don't know. But the metallic Birkin, you can have this purse today for the low price of $139,000. I could sell my house and still not afford that purse. We've got extravagance down to a T, don't we? You don't relate to purses. How many of you are thrilled it is Super Bowl Sunday in the room? All the Chiefs fans, give me a shout. All the Chiefs haters, give me a shout. Oh, my. I did not expect that <laughs> at all. I just know Taylor Swift's playing. That's all I know. <laughs> Maybe you need the perfect setup for the big game. This right here is the Samsung 291-inch LED wall. This is not just any TV. 291 inches. Massive. Anybody want one? You can have it for $513,000. Hey, let's admit it. We're good at extravagance in our culture. We've got it down pat. We know the definition, the very definition of to be extravagant is exceeding the limits of reason. $139,000 for a purse is exceeding the limits of reason. Exceeding the limits of reason or necessity. The secondary definition, lacking in moderation, balance, and restraint. The third, extremely or excessively elaborate but can I submit to you, what if we applied that same concept, exceeding the limits of reason, to generosity? Amen. What if instead of being a culture, especially his church, that was extravagant in our hoarding, extravagant in our receiving, what if we applied that same idea, exceeding the limits of reason or necessity, going above and beyond when it comes to generosity? What does that even look like? Well, let's look. 
by starting in Acts chapter 4. This is the early church. This is what was taking place as, as people were, were coming into faith in Jesus Christ, their lives being transformed. And we read this of the early church, Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Today what we're going to do is look at uh, three simple statements that work their way out of us as we begin to grow in extravagant generosity. And the first is this. Extravagant generosity says, I see nothing as mine. This is a deeply complicated concept for Westerners. It just is, and that's okay. Don't feel condemned this morning. Don't feel condemned. In the, if you're already thinking, oh, he's just going to talk about giving the whole time. Hey, just lean in. Just asking you to lean in and, and hear us out today. Okay? Extravagant generosity says, I see nothing as mine. Now, there have been occasions where this very passage, as well as Acts chapter 2, have been mistakenly un, uh, misunderstood, have been uh, misinterpreted, as some sort of prescription for a political or governmental economic structure. Let me be clear. This record from Dr. Luke, the pattern demonstrated by Jesus and his disciples, this is not about socialism. Because let's go back to what Dwayne mentioned last week. Part of context is remembering our audience. All right? This was written about... And to who? The church. So when Luke recorded this early history of the church, this is not about a mandated imposition on all people, but simply a response to the needs of those around them. That's what this was about. And so this took place because these people adhered to a belief that nothing that belonged to him was his own. Nothing that they had was their own. In the Greek language, that word own is idios. Idios, and it means peculiar to the individual. Unique to the individual. And so, all of them, the church, as it was growing, none of them looked at anything they had as peculiar or unique, being exclusively theirs. It was a view that was held that if you need something and I have access to it, I'll make it happen. That if you have a need and I can be a part of helping meet it, you can count on me. That's why we see in Acts chapter 2. That the early church, when there was a need, they would even sell things to help someone else in the church. Their possessions, their property, their home, their money. Hear me. All of these were simply tools to make a difference in the world around them and to point back to Jesus. That's what it was for them. And how do we do it? How do you... How do you see nothing as yours? Well, let me ask you a question to kind of build towards this. Uh, You can just raise your hand. How many of you have ever used that right there before? They'll get a shot of it for you on the screen up there, right? Can you see that? Everybody got an idea of what we got going on there? How many of you have specifically used this brand right here? Yes? Okay. How about this next one for you? How many of you have uh, ever enjoyed... Some craft mac and cheese, the most synthetic, fake, <laughs> delicious goodness on the face of the planet. Yes? How about this? Are any of you familiar with the name James Cash Penny? Anybody familiar with that name? How about this? Have you ever shopped a JC Penny before? Now, here's the thing. Every single one of these have something in common, and that is that their founders 
These individuals, James Kraft, Henry Hines, and James Cash Penny, every single one of them were not only you know, very intelligent uh, businessmen, very astute businessmen, but they were all solid followers of Christ, deeply devoted to their faith and to God. And all of them had a mindset in common that's actually best uh, verbalized or articulated by another businessman that you've heard me mention before by the name of R.G. Letourneau. R.G. Letourneau was brilliant, not just a businessman, but an inventor, had over 300 manufacturing patents for different processes, machining tools, heavy equipment. It is said that he even supplied over 70% of all of the grading and earth-moving equipment that was used during World War II. But that's not the most interesting thing. Because Letourneau actually came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ at the age of 16. And from that point on, he determined that any blessing that God brought into his life wasn't his own. To the extent that there came a point in his life as he experienced success in the business world that he actually lived off of only 10% of what he made and gave away the other 90 Not just him, but his business as well. Kraft, same story. Heinz, same story. These are individuals who lived off of less than, constantly and consistently. And you say, well, Nate, they had millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. No, no, no. It was a mindset, again, that Letourneau actually was able to express one time when he said this. The question is not how much of my money I give to God but rather how much of God's money I keep for myself. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not yours. That was the most quiet, (laughs) unwilling, (laughs) lacking in response response. I've ever seen, but I get it. I get it. Because, wow, this right here, Eterno saw nothing as his. It was all a gift of God. And as followers of Christ, here's the thing. As Christ followers, everything we give belongs to God. Amen? We're comfortable with that. We're okay with that statement because once I give it, whether it's to the the single mom who can't afford the groceries and is about to put back the milk in line or whether it's to uh, uh, one of the church's impact partners like Pregnancy Solutions or whether it's to the church itself, when we give, it's easy to go, well, it's God's. You know why? Because it's not in our hands anymore. But what we're not comfortable with is this. It's not just that what we give belongs to God. What we earn belongs to God. What we spend belongs to God. What we save belongs to God. We are simply stewards. That's it. So if that is the case, why not give generously, extravagantly, in ways that strengthen the body of Christ, in ways that radically impact our community? Because the fact of the matter is, Paul expressed it beautifully to a young pastor by the name of Timothy when he said this, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. As my youth pastor used to say, nobody's really in the business of hooking up U-Hauls to hearses. We can't take it with us. So why not be a people who seek to give it away instead of trying to hoard it for ourselves. And listen to me, this will lead to the next point because I want you to understand. This value for us as a church and for us as believers and followers of Christ, it is not about getting more from you. It's about what God wants for you. It's about what he wants you to experience as you as you ask him to grow the spirit of generosity within you. It's not about trying to bank up more for us because many times extravagant generosity will express itself not by giving to a church, but by giving to a need right there around you. 
which takes us to this. Extravagant generosity also says, I seek opportunities to bless. I look for them. I actively have my eyes and ears open and ready so that I can bless others. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. And I want to read for you, before I read verse 25, I do want to read verse 24. You can put that in your notes. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says this. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. That is not a monetary promise. Jesus is not your jackpot. Okay? This is about richer in our relationship with the God of the universe. Okay? One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and suffers want. Another says, I don't see how. I'm not really able. I'm not available. And yet still finds himself wanting. Now, look at verse 25. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And one who waters will himself be watered. I love this rendering. Many translations accurately say this, like the New King James says, the generous will prosper. But this actually drills down to to the deeper meaning in the Hebrew as it says, whoever brings blessing. The picture that Solomon is offering here quite literally is of one who comes with a gift in hand, open and ready to release it. One who comes with that posture, one who gives in that manner, will be enriched. You see, what starts happening is we start getting an understanding that, oh, wait, this isn't necessarily about me giving for the sake of them. It's giving to discover God's doing something in me. One who sees a need, one who takes action. I'm just going to say this. If we are, in fact, a movement inviting people to know Jesus and love others, then that means the opportunities in our church family to bless someone need to matter. That means that the needs in our community have to matter. That extravagant generosity that moves towards those needs has to be at the heart of everything we do. My pastor, Pastor Andy Craver, often puts it this way. I refuse to say God bless you without becoming the blessing. I refuse to look at someone and what they're going through and what they're facing and say, oh man, I'm praying for you without saying, wait, first of all, I'm going to pray for you right now. And second of all, what can I do to be a part of the blessing in your life? What is that going to look like? And you might say, but Nate, I can't do that for everyone that I come into contact with. I can't do that for everyone in the church. First of all, that's why we all have to get in on extravagant generosity at some level. But second of all, you say, Nate, I just can't do that for everybody. Hear me. Do for one what you wish you could do for everybody. Nate, I can't give as much as so-and-so at church. That's okay, friend. Stop living in a state of condemnation and constant comparison to someone else. Give what God has placed on your heart, what you have purposed, as Paul says, and give it not begrudgingly, but as a cheerful giver. Whatever that looks like, take that step towards him. And listen, imagine the difference if we would do that. Look at this text again. It says that Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And one who what? Waters will himself be watered. One who waters will himself be watered. Now all of us for about the past 16 months, a little bit longer now, have been like pushing through this frustration since Ian came through, right? Trying to get houses repaired. We still have blue tarps. We were just talking about this with Michelle's folks last night. Uh, Many of you are still fighting with insurance companies. Many of you are still frustrated with repairs. And I remember right after it happened, maybe you felt, maybe this was just me, maybe it's because we were new to the area. But uh, I remember after that storm came through, we had been here, I guess about two years or something like that, two and a half years. And I remember after it was done, walking outside and just the overwhelming magnitude of what do we do now? 
Like everything's a mess. Trees are everywhere. Roofs are blown off. Water's getting into places it was never intended to be. I'm just like, what do we do? And so we just got to work. Many of you just got to work. They said, well, we got to do something. I remember the day of uh, a few from this church ended up over at the Ross's house, lost their, their whole ceiling, fell in on the house. And it was like, well, we can't do a whole lot about this. There were several who just said, well, let's just take off shutters. At least they'll have light so that they can see. Many of you were here on this church property that, that same day and then in the days that followed. Well, what do we do? There's a whole lot of shingles that blew all over it. Let's just pick them up and put them in trash cans. What, did, what do we do with them next? I don't know. Wait till they start running trash again. It, it was just, what? And I know on many of those occasions, I, I had the blessing of getting to be able to be a part of that and, and clean up and go to people's houses. And then there was our own house, right? You know, many of you experienced this where my whole front room was filled with water and Tim Drum and I sat there and dug around and like, I don't know where this came from. We have no clue still to this day, but I had to do something. And so I started just ripping out drywall. I'm like, I got to take this out anyway. And in all of this stuff, whether it was ripping out drywall or replacing the shutters that blew off of the front of our house that are probably in New Jersey by now, I don't know. But in doing all of this, uh, those first few days, it was cool and kind of nice, but then the heat kicked back in and you started sweating. And when you're digging trenches to try and waterproof the front of the house, and just sweat, sweat, sweat. And I can remember Mama Cedar would come to me in those moments and she'd have one cold glass of water in this hand and another cold glass of water in, and she would say, hey, you need some water. You need to drink. And so I would guzzle it down. And all of a sudden, I would feel like, whew, kind of a second wind. You know, she was going, here, you need to drink it down. Never drank the second one, took it, just dumped it straight on my head. <laughs> but, but she brought that to me. And in that moment, it revitalized me. It refreshed me. That is exactly what that verse means. The word waters means to refresh, to satisfy, to drench, to saturate. Whoever brings blessing and open-handed, here's a gift, will be enriched. And one who refreshes, who satisfies, who saturates, will himself be refreshed. Are you seeing it? It's not about what we want from you. It's not about us standing up here and throwing down some really poor teaching on a certain idea of, well, if you give this, you'll get that. No, 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 no. That's baloney. This is about when we give, God does a work in our hearts that transforms us and changes the way we look at the world around us. Who can't, listen, I know, I know we've got bills to pay and things to take care of. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about living with a spirit that says, what can I give? What can I do? It's not about big or small. It's just about what Jesus has done and the work that he's doing in us. So let's seek out. Let's Let's actively pursue ways to refresh others. Let's saturate our spheres of influence with generosity. Let's drench this community of Port Charlotte with generosity. Let's make them look at Movement Church and say, why do y'all keep giving stuff to us? <laughs> Amen? I want them to look at Movement Church and say, but y'all could build a building. We'd rather bless you. But y'all could make room to put more People in seats. No, we'd rather bless you. And listen, he who refreshes, even as a body, will be refreshed. Amen. Let's watch what God does in us. Jesus himself was quoted by the disciples in Acts chapter 20 as saying, It is more blessed to give than to receive. There's a powerful cycle that develops. All of a sudden, there's greater fulfillment and joy that comes into our lives because we're giving extravagantly, pouring into impact partners, into our community, into missionaries and international workers around the world. And all of it comes down to this. Extravagant generosity is able to see nothing as mine. 
is able to seek out opportunities to bless because it is stirred by the cross. Extravagant generosity says, I am stirred by the cross. Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And beginning in verse 7, he says this, since you excel in so many ways, hear him, he's praising the church at Corinth, okay? He's like, good job, guys. You excel in your faith. Praise God. You're excelling in your faith. Your faith in him. Your faith in what he can do. You're excelling in your gifted speakers. I don't know about that one. But you're excelling in your knowledge. You're excelling in your enthusiasm and your love from us. He says, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. It literally translates in the gift of generosity. I want you to grow. I want you to excel in this. Don't miss what Paul is saying here. He goes on. I'm not commanding you to do this. Please pause and underline that in your Bible. Because some of you in this room, unfortunately, have lived with decades of religious baggage where a manipulative religious leader stood in a pulpit and commanded you to give X amount every time at this time, and if you didn't, your tires were going to blow out and your washing machine was going to fall apart. Now listen, before you walk away and like, oh, well, Nate, uh, Nate's saying we don't have to tithe. No, what I'm telling you is that the tithe has been one of the most destructive things to the church because for some, it has become an unnecessary burden to ever introduce them to extravagant generosity, and for others, it's become a pharisaical platform to say, well, I give this when they really should be given more because of the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm preaching, <laughs> and I love you, and security, please come see me after. But he says, I'm not commanding you to do this, but I'm testing where your love is. Are you genuine in what you say that God is doing in you by comparing it with the eagerness of other churches? You know, oh, here it is. He says, I want you to grow in giving, the grace of giving, because you know the generous grace of Jesus Christ. As Mama Sita said just a couple of weeks ago, when generosity is doing its work in us, we don't glue our eyes to a calculator. We lift them to the cross. Because here's the thing. If extravagant generosity is born out of obligation, it is neither extravagant nor generous. If extravagant generosity is born out of a desire to be recognized, acknowledged, or to find favor, it is neither extravagant nor generous. And as I already alluded to, if extravagant generosity is obsessed with percentages more than the posture of the heart, it is neither extravagant more generous. Extravagant generosity is a response to the grace of God. Go back to our definition, right? Extravagant is exceeding, right? The limits of reason or necessity. I only need to do this or it's only reasonable to do this. Jesus says, Look at, look at what I did. Consider that. Let that be what motivates you. Let that be at the heart of all of this. It's an act of gratitude for all that he's done. Again, it's what we want for you. We want you to be able to worship as you give to a great God as he opens doors of opportunity for you to bless others. That's why Paul says, I'm checking. I'm checking to see if your money is where your mouth is. Do you love him? Answer Paul's question. Do you love him? Okay. Show that. Pray that he would open that in your heart. And listen again. Say, but, but Nate, no. Just go to him and say, Lord, 
help me see more clearly how I can watch this beautiful gift unfold in my heart and life. Show me opportunity. Show me how I can grow. You love others? Show it. And I want to close with this. I'm done. I promise. They're like, I'm not coming back next week. <laughs> yeah, you will. You know you will. You crazy kids, you. Listen, when, when we first introduced this, uh, like I said, just, just a little under three years ago, we also attached some targets that we said, well, because we want to grow in extravagant generosity, what's that going to look like? Right? You can have a vision, but, but if you don't have a way for that to walk itself out, you're, you're just kind of aimlessly doing whatever. So for us, we presented this statement. In order to encourage extravagant generosity, we'll foster a spirit of just that by investing a million dollars into partnerships and impact efforts in our community and our world. Now that goal was keeping in mind that we were looking at a target of about five and a half years. That's what we wanted to see. So this was the goal. Keep that in your mind, okay? The other that I love was this. We'll initiate and foster relationships with 15 vision impact partners whose goal is to affect change in our local community and beyond. I'm thrilled that this morning, and I want you to hear this before I show you anything else and then we're done, okay? I'm glad that I get to take the words of Paul and say to you all, instead of I want you to grow in this gracious act of giving, I'm glad that I get to say, Movement Church, thank you for growing in the gracious act of giving. Because you have responded to the prompting and the moving of the Holy Spirit in your lives in a way that makes my heart smile, as does it our whole staff. So here's the update for you, and I'll close. The update is, that was our goal. We said we want to have 15 impact partners in the next five and a half, six years. As of today, we have six impact partners that we are fully connected to. We've got Gator Wilderness. We've got Pregnancy Solutions. We've got Habitat for Humanity. We've got uh, the Homeless Coalition. We've got, did I already say Gator Wilderness? Gator Wilderness, uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship, Better Together. And these are organizations, hear me, not just that we throw a check at once a year. These are organizations you're serving in that we've allowed for pathways for you to connect. We got six of those, and in three weeks, we're announcing another one. So I have seven impact partners that we are connected to deeply and do life with. That said, with those impact partners, you have given $76,000 in two and a half years that has gone just solely to those impact partners. $76,000. I'm gonna let you clap, but I gotta keep talking, okay? This right here is super cool because this is what extrav extravagant generosity looks like when we stop putting it in a box. This gift is in addition to that because one of our families right here at this church at the end of the year said, hey, we want to do something special for one of these impact partners. They had it all worked out. And it turns out that partner was doing a matched gift. And then this family where they were employed matched the gift as well. So a $4,000 gift turned into $12,000 like that to one of our impact partners. That's cool. Listen to this. In the past two and a half years, over $72,000 has gone out of this place in benevolence to help people who have found themselves in a tough time, to help them pay for a rent where they got behind or a light bill. And listen, what I really want to celebrate is this. As huge as that is, that some of those have been to help some of you, some have been to those in our community. As of late, thanks to the amazing Heather Rodriguez that came on our team this past year, a lot of those people that we were able to help are now members of this family and are thriving as a result. Amen? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Over $140,000 just in the past two and a half years that you have given to the Great Commission Fund, which actually allows us to help support missionaries and international workers and church planners all over the globe. All told, just so you know, that gift has been over a million over a million in the past 20 years. 
that you all have given. That's huge. But just in two years, you've given $140,000. Look at this. $82,654 in Christmas gift offerings that have helped fund domestic and international projects like finishing out the chief's house at Gator Wilderness or building the dorms in West Papua, Indonesia. That's what you all have done. And that means some of you are here back in the fall and heard it at our vision gathering that like we were hoping to get to this certain number. I can tell you that just between November and now, it is amazing what you all have done. And to date, two and a half years, $554,000 have gone out. None of that stayed here. Not a dime of that stayed here. Every bit of it went out of this place to bless our community, to make a difference. Church, let's go. Let's keep going. This is exciting. This is the kind of stuff that the church was made for, and we're getting to do it. So let's keep rolling. Let's keep seeing it happen. This week you can pray, where am I? From from extravagant to maybe non-existent right now. Don't walk away in condemnation. Simply begin to pray, God, how can I be stretched? Giving to my church, giving to my neighbor, giving to my community. How can my finances, my possessions, even my home, be used for your glory and the good of others? Amen. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time together. And I pray that as we leave from this place, we would be stirred by the cross. That your extravagant generosity, the giving of your very life would move us to give for the good of others and for your glory. Take us from this place, challenged but encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Listen, as you go, I wanna tell you, you've got an action step waiting on you right out there. Our giving wall for students who are going to camp this summer. That's a chance for you to stop by and say, I wanna start today, or I wanna keep going today. Grab one of those, give a gift for those kids who are heading to camp, help support them. God bless you, we love you, have a good one.